Hey guys, I'm here with another uh, limited review video for Magic Origins. Um, I just posted this week a bunch of videos uh, talking about the best commons and uncommons in each color um, and talking about the relative strength of those colors um, and how that is influenced by what the best commons and uncommons are. But I also decided to do a video about basically the top 10 rares and mythics you're happiest to open in pack one. These are the basically the 10 bombiest bombs in the set, um, the rares that you're absolutely never going to pass in pack one. And in fact, sometimes some of these are so powerful, you'll even be willing to splash for them um, because they're just that good. Um, so that's the list we'll be talking about today in this in, for this part of the limited review. Um, before we get into the top 10, I do have some honorable mentions, some cards that were pretty close and that I had on list at various times, um, but got pushed off by other things. Um, and these are those. Uh, we got Woodland Bellower, Soul Blade Jin, and Manor Gorger Hydra. Uh, Woodland Bellower seems like he'd be really good, and he is very good. Don't get me wrong. You probably still first pick him most of the time, just not as happily as you first pick the other cards on this list. Um, the problem is there's only... 13 um, converted mana cost 3 or less green creatures in um, in Magic Origins, um, which it sounds like a lot, but none of them are that impressive. None of them are big utility creatures, and none of them do a whole lot. They're okay. I mean, Woodland Bellower still is 6 to get you a 6-5 and probably a 2-2 two -two or a 1-3 or a 3-3 or, three -three or something like that. So he's still very good. He gets you two bodies for 6, um, and he's pretty big on his own anyway. Um, and I think he'll actually be worth a lot. So, you know, if you draft for value, um, as I often do so that I can keep drafting, I think he'll end up being worth a lot because he's a mythic A and B because he has a lot of, um, capabilities, um, that are useful for, uh, a lot of decks that are in modern right now. Um, he's sort of like a collected company, uh, with the body. Um, the next card, and it's the only blue card in this whole list, and it's only an honorable mention, so that tells you something about the power of blue rares. Um, is Soul Blade Jin. Um, he's 5 for a 4 3, and he costs double blue, so he's hard to splash. Woodland Bellower also is useless as a splash, incidentally, because he can only get you green creatures. But anyway, the Soul Blade Jin is a lot like um, Strong Arm Monk from uh, Dragons of Tarkir, who was a 5 mana 3 3, who had the same whenever you cast a non creature spell. Creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 on the turn. The difference is Soul Blade Jin has flying, um, and additionally, um, it's, I mean, the Strong Arm Monk, I think, is very good, too. I think it's a pretty underrated uncommon in uh, um, Dragons of Tarkir draft. Um, and Soul Blade Jin, just like the Strong Arm Monk, which is a white creature from Dragons of Tarkir, when you swing with it, your opponent really has to think about um, the potential cards you could have in your hand because you could end up punishing them. Um, you know, all of your creatures can get an Anthem effect if you have an instant in your hand, and your opponent has to keep that in mind. And then the third one is Mana Gorger Hydra, who's definitely also very good, and I think you probably first pick a lot of the time, um, unless you maybe you have some premium removal in the pack. That's true for Soul Blade Gen too. I think um, if you have premium removal, there's probably some you take over him. Um, but Mana Gorger Hydra is very good. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Anytime an opponent plays any kind of spell, um, and it's a three mana one one with Trample, and it'll just you know if your opponent doesn't remove it right away. It quickly becomes larger and larger, and then it becomes out of range of burn um, and even harder to remove. So it's just a very good aggressive card if you can get it out early. Um, on the other hand, it's a pretty awful top deck late game, um, unless unless the board state is stalled, in which case it's a good top deck. But if you really need you know a creature to get out there to help you, Mana Gorger Hydra is pretty awful to draw late game. Whereas Soul Blade Jin and Woodland Bellow are both very good late game. So um, let's keep in mind. All right, so we're going to move to the top 10, and for the 10th one, I kind of treated, and I included all of the Planeswalkers who aren't Jace, basically. Um, I think Jace is the weakest of all of them. Um, he, his ability, he can filter cards, draw a card, discard a card, um, is his ability, and then when you have um, a certain number of cards in your graveyard, he flips. I can't remember the number right now, so he's pretty, he's pretty easy to flip, though. I think it may only be three or four cards, but he's very easy to flip. But his abilities really aren't that good. Um, he has his plus one is um, target creature and opponent controls gets minus two, minus zero until your next turn. And he has a minus three that lets you cast a spell from your graveyard as if it had flashback, basically. Um, and his ultimate ability really isn't that good either. It's just um, 
milling. Uh, it gives you an emblem that every time you play a spell, your opponent mills the top five cards. So he's just not nearly as good as these four are. I think these four are, the better, are better than Jace, and I think they're all definitely first pickable. I don't think Jace is always first pickable. These guys are all definitely first pickable. Uh, if you ever, these should probably never get passed, um, unless somehow one of the other cards on this list is, you know, in the pack as a foil or something like that. Uh, these should never be passed. I don't have them in any particular order here. They're all very good. Um, I do think that Kithion might be the best in limited. Um, he's like the best one drop in the set is a two one that can become indestructible, and he's also relatively easy to flip as long as you swing with him. And two other creatures, um, and he's easy to save because you give him indestructible. He flips, and then he becomes this big beater. Um, you know, he can turn in, just like most incarnations of Gideon, he can become a 4-4 soldier with indestructible um, as a zero ability. He can give creatures indestructible and untap those creatures. And um, it can make your opponent's creatures attack Gideon instead of attacking you. Um, so that's, you know, all, all good abilities. Um, Nissa Vastwood Seer is also very good. When she comes into play, she helps you ramp. She searches your library only for a forest. It's important to keep in mind. Um, and she ha whenever a land enters a battlefield under control, if you control seven or more lands after it comes into play, Nissa transforms. And I think her Planeswalker um, may be one of the stronger, her Planeswalker side. I think it might be the strongest of all of them. I like it a lot anyway. It can put a 4-4 green elemental creature into toe, into play. It is a legendary, so you can't put a bunch of them into play. It can reveal the top card of your library. Um, and if it's a land card, you put it on the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand. So it's a draw card that can also ramp you, her plus one. Um, and she can also untap up to six target lands. And they be permanently become 6-6 six, six, uh, elemental creatures. Um, you can also use that for ramp if you really need to in other formats. But here, it's mostly the elemental part is going to be huge. Liliana is also very good. A 3-mana 2-3 lifelink is already very good. Um, and whenever any creature you control dies, as long as it's not a token, Liliana transforms, and she gives you a zombie. She's the only one of them that when she transforms also does something else other than transforming. She gives you a zombie creature token. Um, like usual, Liliana makes people discard cards, which is a powerful effect and limited. Um, and it can also return non-legendary creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield for minus X, where X is a converted mana cost. And um, the, her emblem is incredibly powerful. Um, the most powerful of uh, all of... I think her ultimate is more powerful than anyone else's. Um, she gets the ability that whenever a creature dies, you gain control of it. Um, it includes your own creatures. So your own creatures don't die, and it includes your opponent's creatures. So you just get to keep them forever. Um, and then there's Chandra, who is a 3-mana 2-2, two -two, who can tap and ping only players and then anytime you play red spell chandra untaps um and then if you do three damage with chandra which means you can for example if the board's open for whatever reason you can swing with chandra for two um and then you can play uh any red spell and untap chandra and then tap chandra and chandra becomes uh, a planeswalker um chandra's abilities are all good uh, she can burn the opponent for two she can burn a creature for two for minus two um and her ultimate is basically um it's huge it does six damage to the opponent and then at every upkeep they take three damage uh, they get an emblem that says they take three damage um so it's incredibly powerful um i think i think um liliana is probably the strongest i may have said this earlier i think it's probably liliana nissa chandra and gideon in that order um at least their planeswalker side you have to take into account kithian on the other side is also incredibly good so uh and definitely better than chandra or nissa so but yeah so those four planeswalkers are all dudes you'll never pass you might pass jace like i said although he'll probably be worth something so probably not um so now we'll move to the more fair cards all of the rest are just one card um they're not this is the only one that's multiple cards like that and at number nine i have guilt leaf winnower um it's a five mana elf three and two black for a four three with menace so it has evasion which is already pretty good. Definitely not worth the rare, but it probably gets see play in a lot of decks of 5-mana 4-3 with Menace. But the thing that makes it really powerful is that when it enters the battlefield, it can destroy any non-elf whose power and toughness aren't equal. Um, so that's actually more creatures than you'd think. It's not all creatures, unfortunately. Um, you are going to be limited sometime when you can play her. That's why she's a little lower on this list. Um, you know, She's still very good. I think you never pass her. A removal spell with a body that has evasion is very good, and that's what she is. 
Um, and she's also an elf, so any elf synergies you have, she gets even better. Um, so yeah, she's definitely number nine. She's very good. Uh, don't ever pass her in pack one, I would say. Um, next, we have another black card that also costs five, and this is Priest of the Blood Rite. Um, when it enters the battlefield, you put a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token with flying onto the battlefield. And the setback for that, the, the downside of that, which there would have to be because you're paying five mana for seven power, five of which has flying, is you lose two life at the beginning of your upkeep. Um, that's also, the setback on this isn't as big as you'd think. The setback is, the, the downside is on the demon, not on the demon token, it's on this cleric. Um, so if you can get rid of your cleric, which there's lots of ways to do, your opponent may also end up having to kill it. Um, I mean, it's definitely too damage. You're going to have to think about whether or not they want to block and kill because um, they're, you're also hurting yourself every turn with it. And in addition to that, there are a number of bounce spells in this format, most of them in blue, as you'd expect. I think all of them in blue. And if you bounce your own Priest of the Blood Rite, you can just keep making um, black demon creature tokens. Uh, this is a card I'm seriously considering putting in. Uh, my Conjurer's Closet modern budget deck, um, if you've been watching the videos of that. It abuses comes into play abilities, and this is definitely the kind of comes into play ability uh, that abusing can uh, win you the game pretty quickly. Um, but the point is, it's very good. Don't ever pass it. It's an extremely powerful card. I would never pass this card if I opened it in pack one. And then next we have Hyxis Prison Warden. Um, he's five mana for a 4-4 four, four with flash. Um, so you can cast him anytime you can cast an instant. And then, in addition to that, um, when a creature deals combat damage to you, if Hyxis uh, entered the battlefield this turn, um, you can exile that creature until Hyxis leaves the battlefield. So sort of the, you know, the white removal effect, Oblivion Ring, Banishing Light, Silk Wrap, etc. Only he's easier to remove than any of those. Um, but the fact that he has Flash can be pretty great. There are going to be some situations um, where you just want to play Hyxis with flash to block something and kill it. Um, unfortunately, the fact that they made it to only whenever a creature deals combat damage to you prevents you from getting two for ones, uh, which he would be able to do, and he'd be much higher on this list if you could flash him in, block, and then kill another, exile another attacker. Uh, it would be a huge effect, but he doesn't do that. He's still very good, though. He's another removal spell with a big body, um, and he can hit more things than um, the, the Black Elf we talked about at number nine. Although, he can only hit things if they've damaged you, so it's limited in its own way. But I think he's better than the elf is. Um, then next, we have, at number six, Pia and Kiran Nalar. Um, these guys are incredibly good. The closest comparison is Siege Gang Commander, which has been reprinted in more recent sets, but is originally from Onslaught Block. Um, and it, It's a five mana, two, two, that puts three one, one goblins into play, and then it can sacrifice any goblin for one and a red to do two damage. Um, to target creature or player. Pia in Kiran Nalar is a 4-mana 2-2 two, two that puts 2-1-1 one, one colorless stop your artifact creature tokens onto the battlefield. They have flying. And then you can sacrifice any artifacts um, for 2 and a red and have them shock something, do 2 damage to target creature or player. Um, and that's a pretty huge effect. Um, first of all, you're paying 4 for 4 power, which is very good. 2 of the power has flying. And then if you're in the artifact archetype, um, which you don't have to be for this card to be good, that's why I still would say don't pass it. It's good in any archetype, but it's even better in the art. It's incredible in the artifact archetype. Um, but its ability uh, to be a removal spell in addition to being an aggressive creature um, is very strong. Um, and, it, you know, it gives you reach in the late game where, you know, if you have six mana, you can do four damage to your opponent if your Thopters are in play. Um, and even more than that if you're in the artifact archetype. Um, so, yeah, it's a very strong card. Don't ever pass that one either. Um, at number five, we have Outland Colossus, who's just a crazy, crazy card, the kind of card that never would have happened a few years ago. Used to be a five mana, six, six, had some sort of um, negative to it. This one actually has two positives. First of all, he's five mana for a six, six, so he's already really good. But then he has Renown six. He's the only guy who doesn't have Renown one or two, uh, which are what every other card has. There's nothing in between one, uh, two and six. There's just six. And that's what he has. Um, and he also can't be blocked by more than one creature. So your opponent is going to have a really hard time double blocking and killing him. Uh, there aren't that many 6-6s six that will be on the table on turn 5. Or you know even things that could double, only block one with one creature and kill him. So eventually he's probably going to get through for damage. You know He can be removed, but he becomes a 12-12 if he gets through for damage. Um, and he just becomes ridiculous. And there are green cards that can give trample. Um, 
the Wolfpack Alpha thing can give Trample, the thing I talked about in the Uncommon, I talked about in the Green video, um, and there are other effects that can give this dude Trample too. So he's just, he's crazy, uh, just a crazily costed card. I mean, he's more boring than the cards we've talked about so far. So I'll have kind of interesting effects, whereas he's just a huge, efficiently costed beater. But, I mean, if you see this guy, draft him, take him. Uh, you may even want to try to splash him, even though he's double green. Um, he's just that good. Uh, so Outland Colossus is very good, but that's what there are four rares I think are even better and or mythics that I think are even better than Outland Colossus And those next one is Kithian's Irregulars, uh, which is a very good card. It's four mana for a four three And even if it didn't have renown one, which it has it would be playable because it has for double white tap target creature This is a hard one to splash because of that cost um, but if you know if you take this in your first pick i would say try as hard as you can to stay in white just because this card is so strong you know you can you know if you have enough mana you can tap down all your opponent's stuff uh, i mean it gets you know with double white it gets a little hard but it also makes it easy for it to get renowned because it can tap a blocker and then swing in and become a five four but it can just keep tapping creatures down it's always been a powerful effect most of the time when a creature can tap another creature um the creature causing the tapping has to tap as part of the cost but in this case Kithian's Irregulars doesn't, and that's what makes it so strong. In addition to being a 4-mana 4-3 four with Renown 1. Uh, so if you took off either Tap Target Creature or Renown 1 and left the other, this card would still be very good. It might not make this list, but it'd still be very good. Um, but yeah, so it's a very strong card, um, but there's still three better. The next is Archangel of Tithes, which is a mythic. It's also not one you're probably going to splash because of its triple white cost. Um, I think it's good they did that because... Uh, making it easy to splash this powerful card would be kind of nuts. Um, and Archangel of Tides is really good. I think it's probably going to make a splash in standard because it's so efficiently costed. It's a four mana flyer that's a three five, and as long as it's untapped, creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. So it's kind of you know half of the ghostly prison effect, but on a much on a body instead of on an enchantment. Um, but then in addition to that, it has as long as it's attacking. Creatures can't block unless your controller pays one for each of those creatures. So this card, you know, in addition to being a 3-5 uh, flyer for four, which is already good, this card really shuts down your opponent's plans. They have to, if they want to survive, if you're playing an aggressive, say, the white-red deck in this set, if they want to survive, they're going to have to leave mana untapped every turn. Um, if they want to be able to block, um, or if, I mean, in, you know, if you're in a different situation, if you top deck this in the late game, Playing the Archangel of Tithes can stem your opponent from building their board more um, because you can keep it behind as a blocker and they just constantly have to spend mana um, to attack into your Archangel of Tithes. Um, and the Archangel of Tithes can block a lot of things anyway. So it's very good. Um, I think it's, I'd say it's the best creature in the whole set, um, which would tell you that the next two things aren't creatures. I think this is the best creature in the whole set. It's a mythic. You're not going to see it a lot. I, I estimate that it'll be worth a lot of money, too, so people are going to pick it uh, in pack two and three, probably on, on a Magic Online anyway. Uh, they're going to pick it even if, um, you know, they're not in white, just because it's going to I think it'll make a splash in a white weenie deck of some kind, um, for sure. So our next two cards, um, as I already sort of uh, foreshadowed, aren't creatures. Um, and we'll take a look at the next one, which is Tragic Arrogance. Um this card is a board sweeper of sorts, and board sweepers are incredibly good and in, in limited, um, mostly because you know you have it in your hand and your opponent doesn't. Um, and in limited, you typically, your opponents will try to build up the field as much as they can. Um, you know, the board state's really important, and you can wait, you know, stay back with your mass removal of whatever kind um, and sort of play to keep yourself alive, but then drop your mass removal spell and kill everything they have. Um, Tragic Arrogance doesn't exactly kill everything. Um, it's not quite, you know, Wrath of God or anything. Um, but it says, for each player, you choose among from among the permanents that player controls an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker. Then each player sacrifices all of their non-land permanents he or she controls. Um, so it's kind of like um, Dune Blast, which destroyed all creatures except one you pick. Except this is more symmetrical, that's why it's cheaper to cast. But you can still leave your opponent with like their weakest creature. You can leave them with their 1-1 elf token or something like that. And you get to hold on to whatever creature you want. You make the decisions here, not your opponent. And you also get to blow up all their artifacts, which is relevant in this format. The red-blue deck's going to be packing a lot of them. 
all but one artifact, I, I should say, and all but one of their enchantments, which is also going to be relevant. There are relevant enchantments in this format. The Planeswalker part isn't that relevant. You're never, well, I shouldn't say never. It could probably happen. Someone extremely lucky, but you're almost never going to encounter someone with two Planeswalkers in this format. But Tragic Arrogance is a really great card that you should never pass and should influence you in probably building a more controlling kind of deck, but it would be good in any kind of deck as an, a big insurance policy. So uh, number two is Mass Board Removal, and so is number one. Um, and it is Languish, uh, which is a big black board removal spell. You know, again, it's not quite Damnation, um, but it gives all creatures minus four, minus four until the turn. In some ways, that's better than Damnation. It can even kill indestructible creatures, um, and that's not something Damnation can do. Um, so it's a really powerful effect. Um, you can play around it when you, again, just like um, the last card, you can play around Languish know, and when you have it in your hand and know you're going to play it eventually, and your opponent doesn't know, They'll play all their creatures, and then Languish will kill, you know, most creatures in this format. Um, and you, it's even more likely to kill them if you do something like swing first with a couple of your guys, and they block, and then you can play Languish to kill everything. Um, so it's an incredibly strong card. Um, I have board, I have mass board removal as number one and two on this list. I think that's true of a lot of limited formats, uh, that whatever the mass removal spells are, are, like the strongest, biggest bombs you can have, the most game-breaking cards you can have. Especially in game one when your opponent, or whatever game you first play it in, when your opponent doesn't even know you have it. Um, in the next games, after you've played these, these mass removal spells, your opponent knows it's a possibility and plays around it. But that can also be to your advantage because your opponent won't commit as much of their hand to the field. And it's, you may not even have Languish in your hand, but they're worried about it. So they don't, they're not as aggressive as they were in the earlier games. So the fact that these make your opponent play differently and can just be, you know, a five for one in a lot of cases... Um, or, you know, you usually kill a couple of your own guys too, so five for three or whatever. Um, but it's very good. Uh, the, the mass board removal is very good. Um, like I said earlier, there's not a single blue rare that made this list, so that's interesting. And there's actually only one red rare that I thought made this list. Um, the other colors were pretty well represented, though. Um, let me know if you think I messed up on any of these ratings. I'm sure I did. Um, once, game, once I start actually playing this format, my ideas will change. These are all just my initial impressions based on you know past limited formats and looking at this limited format um, and I could be wrong uh, about any of these and I will probably admit that when I'm doing my draft videos a few months from now say wow I really thought this card was going to be good and I was wrong or really thought this card was going to be bad and I was wrong an example of that uh, in Dragons of Tarkir was uh, Zephyr Scribe which I thought was going to be really good and it's playable but it's not amazing um, and so that happens all the time um, and, you know, when people evaluate cards for limited, playing with them is the best way of finding out. And unfortunately, we can't do that just yet, uh, but we can soon. So anyway, um, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the list. Let me know what you think about my ratings um, in the comments. And don't forget to like uh, this video if you enjoyed it and to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. Thanks.